Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Woo, that sounded so good. I want to hear it again. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Yes. Yes. May that sound resound in the halls of Yah's throne room. Amen. Amen. All right. I am Paul Roy. This is Shema Yisrael Assembly in Northeastern Colorado, SY7 Ministry. And as always, we are so thankful to Yah to be able to join you on Shabbat and you join us, our Mishpaha, our extended congregation around the world for those who are who follow this ministry regularly. And for anybody just tuning in, we welcome you, brother and sister. We welcome you. If you are seeking the ways and the truth of the Holy Scriptures of Genesis to Revelation, and we're glad that you're here with us, and we just pray, may you be fed, may you be ministered unto you, not by us, but by the Holy Spirit through whatever happens on this live uh, message tonight. So, I got a lot in my head. Real quick, I'm going to make a quick couple announcements, and then we're going to blow the shofars, we're, we're going to sing the Shema, we're going to pray and dive right into it. All right. From now on, uh, we've, we've agreed we're going we're gonna to do a um, Torah portion when we first come on and go live. We're going to do the Torah portion, get that started back up like we used to do in the other congregation. So we'll do that for the first hour. And then after that, we ha we'll have the, the Shabbat message. And today, Brother Anthony is going to be bringing uh, the Shabbat message after the Torah portion is done. We're going to do the Torah portion with the Haftarah and the Brit Hadashah. So just want to let everybody know that. I know people have been excited about us starting to do a Torah portion again. So here we go. And what was the other one? I think that's it. So let's blow the shofars. Let's pray. Let's do the Shema and we'll get into the word of Yah. Amen. Okay. One, two. <laughs> Look like you're about to pass out over there. Awesome. One of these days, how many Yovels do we have? Anthony's got one, I've got one, Mickey's got one. That's a Yemenite. Yovel is the ram's horn, literally. Yeah, that's a Yovel. That's what it's actually called. Uh, shofar is the general term for the ram's horn, the Gemsbach, and the Yemenite. That's an overall, you know, kind of like fruit. It could be strawberries, blueberries, raspberries. That's all fruit, right? Same thing. So, but Yovel is actually the word for uh, ram's horn. So, the correct Hebrew word for ram's horn. Um, okay. Are we ready to pray? Everybody ready? Yep. Abba, Father, we just come to you in prayer. Avinu Malkenu, our Father and our King, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us our bread continually. Please forgive us the debt of our sins as we forgive the debt of those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Fathers, we, we have gathered together on your holy Shabbat. May our very thoughts, your word says in Proverbs, in a couple different places, one, that the wickedness of our thoughts is an abomination to you. So you, you take our thoughts quite seriously. Because in, in other places of your scriptures, you, you tell us that if we, if we commit our ways to you, you will establish our thoughts. And then when we go into the Brit Hadashah, it's even a further witness in the armor of Yah that our mind be wrapped in the helmet of salvation. So the very essence of our thoughts has such an effect in so many other ways. And Father, our thoughts need to be in line with you right now, utterly and completely with nothing else, even next to it, 
that it should not even be in our peripheral vision, as it were. But Father, that our eyes be on you and your holy word on this holy covenant, the very first one you created, this one that you declared like no other, that it marks us and sets us apart unto you, sets us aside, separates us from all the rest of the world and shows the world that we belong to the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. That we are the bond servants of Yeshua HaMashiach, our Messiah, the one and only begotten Son of you. And we thank you for this, Father. So may we be in tune with you so that your Holy Spirit can come upon us fully and not have to hold anything back. So that you would want to come and bow your ear down to your children and hear our praise and hear our worship and hear our, our prayers and hear what we speak about your word. And hear, and, and, and hear us declare the glory of your name. To hear us declare the glory of our creator, the one who gave every Everything to his son to make the heavens and the earth for the heaven is your throne and the earth is your footstool. And we belong to you because you love us so much. This is the fire that is to burn within our bones, as Jeremiah said. This is why you touch the coal to Isaiah's lips. This is why you declared Samuel's words will not fall to the ground. Why? Because of their dedication to you. Because of their willingness to sacrifice everything in their life. Because of their hunger and their desire to be in your presence at all times. To walk fully in the spirit and not in the flesh. To do all that you command to do without question, without messing with your word, without doing anything that would lead anybody astray or, or even weaken our own walk. That we walk in the fullness of your word and obey the word with all of our heart. Because your word says if we do all these things that you will bless every aspect of our life. You will make our enemies rise up and scatter them different, seven different ways. You tell us that you fight for us. You have our back. You have our front. You are to our right and to our left. Father, if we weren't going to get into your word and have a message today, I could stand here until sundown declaring the great and mighty works of you. And every bit of it being from your holy written scriptures. May that be the hunger and desire in our hearts here and around the world. And anybody who listens to this later on, may this be the fire that you are stirring in your saints in the last days to raise us up unto you. Amen. Amen. Father, please, may we not give you lip service and our hearts be far from you. But may we give you lip service because we walk it out with all of our heart. May we, when we speak, it's not to impress, but confess. It's to proclaim and declare the mighty God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the mighty Yah of Yisrael. That is whom we serve. All through the blood of the Lamb, our Messiah Yeshua, we praise you and thank you. Amen and amen. All right. Smile, Israel, Yehovah, Eloheinu, Yehovah, Echad, Yehovah is one. Blessed is the name. His glorious kingdom is forever. Ve'ahavta et Yehovah Elohecha v'cho l'vacha u'v'cho nafshecha u'v'cho me'otecha. And you shall love Yehovah your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. Ve'ahavta l'reicha k'mo'ocha. 
and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Amen. All right, so Bela Alotka is the name of today's uh, Torah portion, and it means to raise up or stand up, right? And it's in... So we're going to read the Torah portion. I'm sorry, when you set up. We're going to read the Torah portion. So if you have availability to write this down or somebody can type it in the comments. The Torah portion part. Man, this mic is making me sound funny. Can we turn it down here? Okay, there, that's better. Uh, Numbers chapter 8, verses 1 through Numbers chapter 12, verse 15. The Haftarah is Zechariah chapter 2, verse 14, through chapter 4, verse 7. And then the Brit Hadashah reading is Matthew chapter 14, 14 through 21. I was reading that without my glasses. That's good. <laughs> Blurry, though. <laughs> okay. So the Torah portion is really, we're just going to read it. I might make a couple of common comments on a couple of parts, but we want to make sure that because we, you know, on Facebook, you can go four hours, then you get cut off live. And I want to make sure that whoever's doing their message, they got at least a few hours to do their message because that's pretty much the average of our time now. <laughs> so, um, Man, I need water. I'm sorry. Mickey, can... Oh, never mind. Is that mine? Thanks, brother. Okay. Well, i give him one back. Thank you. All right. Exodus 8, starting at verse 1. All right, yeah, that. Yeah, see? Eh. Did I read the wrong thing this morning? <laughs> I hope not. No, I didn't. Yeah, okay. All right, and Yehovah spoke to Moshe, saying, Speak to Aharon. Uh, can you turn me down just a hair more? I, I feel like I get the sound. In, in, there we go. Okay. Numbers. Sorry. I, I said, did I say Exodus? I said that by accident. Chapter 8, starting at chapter 8. It was what you and I were reading this morning. And Yehovah spoke to Moshe saying, speak to Aharon and say to him, when you arrange the lamps, the seven lamps shall give light in front of the lamp stand. And Aharon did so. He arranged the lamps to face toward the front of the lampstand as Jehovah commanded Moshe. Now this workmanship of the lampstand was hammered gold. From its shaft to its flowers it was hammered work. According to the pattern which Jehovah had shown Moshe, so he made the lampstand. That's just one more thing I want to throw real quick about that kind of dedication. They took a piece of gold and hammered this whole thing out. Where's our, can you show this real quick? This is a, a, just a terrible replica, but it's just an idea of what it would look like. The real one is actually way bigger in Jerusalem. It's huge. But this is what the menorah is. This is the lampstand. And this was all made out of hammered gold all together. And these guys, their artisanry, their, their workmanship was so blessed by Yah, but these were not people that were like, um, you know, nine to five. They, it was all day long. They worked on this and, and worked and worked and the perfection of what they put it all. That takes pure dedication. You can't give 99% of yourself in that, right? It's got to be 100, amen? amen. It's got to be complete. So it just keep me, keep me. Don't let me preach too long. <laughs> like, all right, reel it in, boy. I got to, you know. <clears throat> all right, verse 5. 
So then Yehovah spoke to Moshe saying, take the Levites from among the children of Israel and cleanse them ceremonially. Um, Thus you shall do to them to cleanse them, sprinkle water of purification on them. Let them shave all their body and let them wash their clothes and so make themselves clean. Then let them take a young bull with its grain offering of fine flour mixed with oil. And you shall take another young bull as a sin offering and you shall bring the Levites before the tabernacle of meeting. And you shall gather together the whole congregation of the children of Israel. So you shall bring the Levites before Yehovah and the children of Israel shall lay their hands on the Levites. So you see what's going on? He is having all of the children lay their hands on who is about to become their, their shepherds. Who's about to be their teachers. Who's about to be their mediator between them and, the, and Yeshua. Amen. Amen. The representation until Yeshua came to be the, the final mediator. Amen. Amen. All right. Um, I read that one. Uh, verse 12. Okay, I'm going to read, reread 12. Then the Levites shall lay their hands on the heads of the young bulls. No, you're right. And Aaron shall offer the Levites before Yehovah like a wave offering. Thank you, whoever told me that. From the children of Israel that they may perform the work of Yehovah. Then the Levites shall lay their hands on the heads of the young bulls. And you shall offer one as a sin offering and the other as a burnt offering unto Yah. To make atonement for the Levites. And you shall stand the Levites before Aharon and his sons. And then offer them like a wave offering to Yehovah. Do you understand why? Anthony, you want to say real quick? Why did, why was Aharon's sons offered up as a wave offering before being dedicated as priests? And because, because they're the first fruits of Aaron, right? Isn't that a part of what the wave offering is? I know there's a couple different wave offerings, but you have the first fruits wave offering. We've got the first high priest. Aaron is a representation of Yeshua as the first, high, first and final high priest. His sons would be a representation of the first fruits yeah. from that. Amen. And we are the first fruits of Yeshua. The saints that come and, and mimic him, mirror him. Amen? Amen. Okay. And I'm sure there's more to it than just that. But that hit me this morning when I was reading that. I was like, wow. He, he, Yah doesn't miss a beat, man. There's nothing missing. The, okay, verse 14. Thus you shall separate the Levites from among the children of Israel, and the Levites shall be mine. After that, the Levites shall go into service the tabernacle of meeting. So you shall cleanse them and offer them like a wave offering. For they are wholly given to me from among the children of Israel. I have taken them for myself instead of all who opened the womb. Okay, there you go. The firstborn of all the children of Israel. For all the firstborn among the children of Israel are mine, both man and beast, on the day that I struck Where'd he go? All the firstborn in the land of Mitzrayim. I sanctified them to myself. I have taken the Levites instead of all the firstborn of the children of Israel. I have given the Levites as a gift to Aharon and his sons from among the children of Israel to do the work for the children of Israel in the tabernacle of meeting and to make atonement. Where'd it go? Uh, for the children of Israel that there be no plague among the children of Israel, when the children of Israel come near the sanctuary. This is, I, do you see how dangerous it is to just approach the sanctuary of Yah just free willy nilly? This is how we should be approaching Shabbat. Am I lying? Does he not call for us to have a holy convocation? Would that not be the same as a holy sanctuary? 
Because the sanctuary is where the presence of Yah is, is what makes it holy, right? Amen. And if he's calling for us to have a holy convocation so that we will come and be, so that he will come and be among us, he gives us the example in Sukkot. He says, I want to walk out and come and walk among you in the camp and find no sin so I can hang out with you. He wants to do that every week on Shabbat. Amen. So why do we just roll up on the tabernacle like that or the holy sanctuary? Any old way we want to. Why are we not making sure that when we roll into Shabbat before sundown, you're making sure you're clean before him physically and spiritually. Amen. Taking a shower and getting clean before you enter into Shabbat, I think is very important to him. He doesn't command us to do it, but do you not want to be clean before him? Look at the whole process here. Man, you even come unto me some other way. They went all the way, shaved the body, everything to be clean before Yehovah. Do you wash your clothes, the clothes that you put on before you enter Shabbat? Are they just the clothes you had that you wore yesterday or earlier in the day? Or do you put clean clothes on? Do you enter in before his presence saying, I am clean outside? And did you take the time to pray, to be in the worship, to repent of anything that you could possibly have done during that week or that day? This is all preparation of getting ready for Shabbat. Amen. Not just cooking food, cleaning the house and everything. This is more important than the rest of that. Amen? Amen. Yeah. Okay. I'm sorry. <laughs> Dude's going to be like, you going to let me preach or what? All right. What verse are we? 20. Thank you. <clears throat> Thus Moshe and Aharon and all the congregation of the children of Israel did to the Levites. <sighs> According to all that Yehovah commanded Moshe concerning uh, the Levites, so the children of Israel did to them. And the Levites purified themselves, washed their clothes, then Aharon presented them like a wave offering before Yehovah, and Aharon made atonement for them to cleanse them. Wow. After that, is that not who the high priest of Melchizedek is? Is that not the very representation of him, amen? amen? To do the atonement for us, to cleanse us? After that, the Levites went in to do their work in the tabernacle of meeting before Aharon and his sons, as Yehovah commanded Moshe concerning the Levites, so they did to them. Then Yehovah spoke to Moshe, saying, This is what pertains to the Levites. From 25 years old and above, one may enter to perform service in the work of the tabernacle of meeting. At the age of 50 years, they must cease performing this work and shall work no more. They may minister with their brethren in the tabernacle of meeting to attend to needs, but they themselves shall not do work. Thus you shall do the Levites regarding their duties. Okay, so in a nutshell, it's essentially this is where the idea is believed that the, the, the priest, after they would do their duties for all these years, then they would like, they don't retire because it says that they minister still. It's like they become the elders and, and uh, among the younger priests who are doing the duties before them, right? And so they, be, they start becoming, you know, elders and whatever it is that they do. So that's the belief that I've heard from uh, commonly. So um, chapter 9, now Yehovah spoke to Moshe in the wilderness of Sinai in the first month of the second year, after they had come out of the land of Misraim, saying... Let the children of Israel keep the Pesach at its Moedim. On the 14th day of this month at twilight, you shall keep it at its appointed time. According to all its rites and ceremonies, you shall keep it. So Moshe told the, the children of Israel, B'nai Israel, that they should keep the Pesach. And they kept the Pesach on the 14th day of the first month, which is Aviv, at twilight in the wilderness of Sinai, according to all that Yehovah commanded Moshe, so the children of Israel did. Now there were certain men who were bef uh, defiled by a human corpse so that they could not keep the Pesach on that day. 
And they came before Moshe and Aharon that day. And those men said to him, we become, uh, we became defiled by a human corpse. We, uh, why are we kept from presenting the offering of Yehovah at its appointed time among the children of Israel? And Moshe said to them, stand still that I may hear what Yehovah will command concerning you. I, I love that. And I, I, there's a part that we're going to cover in here that's just, whoo, it's just like so amazing about the relationship between Moshe and Yah. But it's just like, you know, we're sitting here talking, brother. And hang on a second. Let me find out real quick from what Yah says. You know, it's like, hey, uh, <laughs> but it's not. You know what I'm saying? But it's that easy. Moshe had a special conversation with Yah. Uh, and we, we're going to get into that. I, I just love every part of how that describes that relationship. And how we should be craving and desiring to seek that kind of relationship with him. Amen. Amen. Uh, what am I? Verse 12. Um, no. Nine, then Yehovah spoke to Moshe saying, speak to the children of Israel saying, if any one of any one of you or your posterity is unclean because of a corpse or is far away on a journey, he shall keep the Lord's Pesach. On the 14th day of the second month at twilight, they may keep it. They shall eat it with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. Now, the true Hebrew from that is in the bitterness so not bitter herbs, but bitter herbs are used to represent the bitterness in the Pesach meal uh, today with people. So um, verse 12, they shall leave none of it until morning nor break one of its bones. According to all the ordinances of the Pesach, they shall keep it. But the man who is clean and is not on a journey and ceases to keep the Pesach, that same person shall be cut off from among his people because he did not bring the offering of Yehovah at its appointed time. That man shall bear his sin. This is what will happen during millennial reign. Ezekiel chapters 45 and 46, Zechariah 14, 16 through 21 all teach that. Uh, verse 14, and if a stranger dwells among you and would keep Yehovah's Pesach, he must do so according to the rite of the Pesach and according to its ceremony. You shall have one ordinance, both for the stranger and the native of the land. Now on the day that the tabernacle was raised up, the cloud covered the tabernacle, the tent of the testimony. From evening until morning, it was above the tabernacle like the appearance of fire. <laughs> I Come on, I just... <sighs> Just sit there like if, as much as your brain can picture that over your tent. This massive pillar of fire hanging out over your tent. You know that was seen for everywhere around. You know that everybody for miles around must have been terrified seeing that. It was that's just little like a little dust uh, twirly you'd see across the dirt. This thing was probably massively huge. And, and it, who knows how far up, if it reached all the way to the heavens or just to see that picture of what it must have been like to all be encamped around the tabernacle and to look at this great pillar of fire that was hanging over the tabernacle. Um, so it was always uh, 16. So it was always the cloud covered it by day and the appearance of fire by night. Whenever the cloud was taken up from above the tabernacle, after that, the children of Yisrael would journey. And in the place where the cloud settled, there the children of Yisrael would pitch their tents. At the command of Yehovah, the children of Yisrael would journey. And at the command of Yehovah, they would camp. As long as the cloud stayed above the tabernacle, they remained encamped. Even when the cloud continued long, many days above the tabernacle, the children of Yisrael kept the charge of Yehovah and did not journey. So it was when the cloud was above the tabernacle a few days, according to the command of Yehovah, they would remain encamped. And according to the command of Yehovah, they would journey. You notice how he keeps repeating himself? Because we don't listen. This is why he has to say it again and again and again to get it in our head and in our heart. Verse 22, whether it was two days, a month or a year, 
that the cloud remained above the tabernacle, the children of Israel would remain encamped and not journey. But when it was taken up, they would journey. At the command of Jehovah, they remained encamped. And at the command of Jehovah, they journeyed. They kept the charge of Jehovah at the command of Jehovah by the hand of Moshe. You want to know what stands out to me in this real quick? I have a lot of real quicks here. You know what stands out to me? Is the clarity of the obedience he demands. Why do... Why do we hesitate in seeing that in the commandments? Such as honor the, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy, right? Thou shalt not take Yah's name in vain and all the rest of the commandments. What it is to walk uprightly and righteous before him. Why do we not do it? The cloud stayed, you stay, you don't move. End of discussion. This is not a debate. Why do we think that it's a debate with the word of Yah in his commandments? Why do we allow religious organizations of all kinds to mess with Yah's word? We see what is written. If you read the word for yourself, you have no excuse for not just clearly obeying black and white. Amen? Amen. When the cloud stays, you don't move. You stay. Does he not say to wait on the Lord? Does he not say sit still and know that I am Yehovah? Wow. Okay. <laughs> You're not keeping me on track here, man. It's a good thing I'm remembering. <laughs> Numbers chapter 10. Yehovah spoke to Moshe saying, make two silver trumpets for yourself. You shall make them of hammered work. You shall use them for calling the congregation and for directing the movement of the camps. When they blow both, this is why I want to get two silver trumpets in here again. When they blow both, all the congregation shall gather before you at the door of the tabernacle of meeting. Shabbat Shalom. Amen. But if they blow only one, then the leaders, the heads of the divisions of Israel shall gather you to you. When you sound the advance, the camps that lie on the east side shall then begin their journey. When you sound the advance of the second time, then the camps that lie on the south side shall begin their journey. They shall, excuse me, they shall sound and call for them to begin their journeys. And when the assembly is to be gathered together, you shall blow, but not sound the advance. The sons of Aharon, the priests, shall blow the trumpets, and these shall be to you as an ordinance forever throughout your generations. That's forever. That means it is even for now. Something we need to do some deeper studies and understand how does this apply to us now? That is the way that you should look at the word. Amen, Benjamin. Amen, Clint. Is that not how we should look at the word that when we come to see something and go, huh, this is something that's forever. We should never, ever be the first response of, well, I don't have to do that. Why would you ever want to do that with the word of Yah? How do you know that that might end up being the greatest treasure that Yah gives to you in your walk? That might be the thing that you're missing in your walk to, that will give him, boom, just, where was it say in Deuteronomy 28? The blessings will overtake you. Come on, man. <laughs> Uh, you know, that's what I picture in my head, like some kid running in these blessings, just poof, dog pile you, you know? Yes, I'll take it. Thank you, Father, you know? But we should be excited like that. And then to look at this and go, okay, what kind of blessing would this be in my life? If I do this like this, this is an ordinance and a covenant forever, then this is going to bless my life. Why? Do we not look at the word like that on a regular basis? 
because of the way we've been trained by false religion. Because of the way the world has taught us. Everything is to be received with the least amount of effort and work. And today it's all it's just everybody cry and everybody gets a trophy. Everybody's a winner, but you didn't do anything to win. That is what we have been taught. So we treat the word of Yah the same way. We need to get back to the mind of Yisrael that belongs to him. Go back to the ancient path. Get back to your first love. Hazarah by Teshuvah. Return in repentance. Amen. All right. Where am I at? Nine. Nine. Thank you. <clears throat> when you go to war in your land against the enemy who oppresses you, then you shall sound an alarm with the trumpets and you will be remembered. Why? Why? Before Yehovah your El, as you will be saved from your enemies. Man, we need to pay attention to the words that Yah uses about describing us to him. We need to be more alert and aware of the, the awesomeness of how he loves us so much. Oh, Amen. Also in the day of your gladness and your appointed feast and at the beginning of your months, you shall blow the shofars over your burnt offerings, over the sacrifices of your peace offerings. And they shall be a memorial for you before your El. I am Yehovah, your El. You know, if we blew the shofar a whole lot more in our walk on a daily basis, if in, I, I, I would be willing to bet... If we blew the shofar and we sang or read the Shema in your own time with Yah or as a family every day, I bet that would do a huge difference in your walk as well. That's going to be part three of the prayer challenge. Thank you, Av. I've been asking him for part three. So here you go, guys. It's coming after we finish this stage two. All right. Man, I love you so much. Okay. Thank you. Now it came to pass on the 20th day of the second month in the second year that the cloud was taken up from above the tabernacle of the testimony. And the children of Israel set out from the wilderness of Sinai on their journeys. Then the cloud settled down in the wilderness of Paran. So they started out for the first time according to the command of Yehovah by the hand of Moshe. The standard of the camp of the children of Yehuda set out first according to their armies. Over their army was Nashan, the son of Aminadab. Over the army of the tribe of the children of Issachar was Netanel, the son of Zuar. And over... Huh? Stop. What? Stop. Say who what? Stop. That's it. Stop? Yeah. No, we go to chapter 12, 15. Not 10, 15. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> he, Anthony, he's really excited about his sermon. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I, I'm trying not. Am I still under my hour? Okay. Um, over the army of the tribe of the children. Okay, I read that one. Verse 16. And over the army of the tribe of the children of Zebulun was Eliab, the son of Helan. Then the tabernacle was taken down of the sons of Gershon and the sons of Merari set out carrying the tabernacle and the standard of the camp of Reuven set out according to their armies over their army was Eleazar, the son of Shadur over the army of the tribe of the children of Simeon was Shal uh, Shalumiel, the son of Zerishadai and over the army of the tribe of the children of Gad was Elisaph, the son of Deoel. Then the Kohath, uh, Koh well, the Kohathites set out carrying the holy things the tabernacle would be prepared for their arrival. And the standard of the camp of the children of Ephraim set out according to their armies. Over their army was Elisha, uh, Elishama, the son of Amihud. Over the army of the tribe of the children of Manasseh was Gam uh, Gamalil, the son of Padazur. Uh, Padazur. And over the army of the tribe of the children of Benjamin was Avadon, the son of Gideonai. 
Then the standard of the camp of the children of Dan, the rear guard of all the camps, set out according to their armies. Over their army was Ahazer, the son of Mishadai. Um, over the army of the tribe of the children of Asher was uh, Pagiel, uh, the son of Akron. Uh, over the army of the tribe of the children of Naphtali was Ahira, the son of Anon. Thus was the order of march of the children of Israel according to their armies when they began their journey. Now Moshe said to Hovav, the son of Reuel, the Midianite, Moshe, father-in-law, we are setting out for the place of which Jehovah said, I will give to you. Come with us and we will treat you well. For Yehovah has promised good things to Israel. And he said to him, I will not go, but I will depart to my own land and to my relatives. So Moshe said, please do not leave inasmuch as you know how we are to camp in the wilderness and you can be our eyes. And it shall be if you go with us. Indeed, it shall be that whatever good Yehovah will do to us, the same he will do to you. Do you hear what I just read? Anybody? Did you hear what I just read? Anybody who goes with the children of Israel that are in obedience to him will be blessed because of them. If you walk in obedience to his word, and do not waver to the left or to the right. If you stay focused in his scriptures and do not waver, that anybody who will come with you wherever you go will be blessed. You want to know why? Because what your actions will do will bring them into the fold of our Messiah. Because if they're willing to come and join you, then they are going to become a part of the children of Israel. He will not allow evil to stay with his children. But it will be for a purpose so they can be saved. Is that not an amazing picture? Verse 34. Is that where I'm at? 33. 33. Thank you. So they departed from the mountain of Yehovah on a journey of three days. And the Ark of the Covenant of Yehovah went before them for three days journey to search out a resting place for them. And the cloud of Yehovah was above them by day when they went out from the camp. So it was whenever the Ark set out that Moshe said, Rise up, O Yehovah. Let your enemies be scattered. Let those who hate you flee before you. When it rested, he said, Return, O Yehovah, to the many thousands of Israel. Man, woo, come on to be in this place, to be a part of this. Miss Baha, we are awaiting this second exodus. It's going to be like this, but it's going to be his children. It's going to be him gathering the tribes back into Jerusalem and into Israel. Amen? Amen. This is our journey. This is our future. This is our hope. And one day... We will not say, return, O Yehovah. We will say, Bo Yeshua, Bo. Baruch Atah Hashem Adonai, Elohenu Melech Alam. And come, Yeshua, come. For Jerusalem cries out, blessed is he who comes in the name of Yehovah. Amen? Amen. This is the heart and the fire that should be inside of us. Chapter 11. Now when the people complained, it displeased Yehovah. For Yehovah heard it and his anger was aroused. So the fire Yehovah burned among them and consumed some in the outskirts of the camps. I'm going to read that again. Now when the people complained, it displeased Yehovah. For Yehovah heard it and his anger was aroused. So the fire Yehovah burned among them and consumed some in the outskirts of the camp. May we not be them. 
Then the people cried out to Moshe, and when Moshe prayed to Yehovah, the fire was quenched. So he called the name of the place Teberah, because the fire of Yehovah had burned among them. Now the mixed multitude who were among them yielded to intense craving. So the children of Israel also went, wept again and said, who will give us meat to eat? And here they lie. We remembered the fish we ate freely in Mitzrayim. The cucumbers, the melons, the leeks, the onions, and the garlic. But now our whole being is dried up. There is nothing at all except this manna before us. So now they have taken what scripture calls the food of angels. Remember? Now, angels in the Hebrew, Malak Yehovah, are Malak, to, meaning kings and priests. So this is royalty food. And they spoke like it was something they got through drive through at McDonald's. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. They, not you, the kids. They treated it like it was some nasty cheeseburger that was all dried up. They, they profaned this holy food, heavenly food, that Yah had been feeding them with and giving them. But he, he really gives them what they want here, doesn't he, Gabriel? <laughs> here we go. So, all right. Y'all yeah, want to complain about my holy food. Now, the manna, was like, the manna was like coriander seed and its color like the color of bedellium. And that color is like a, what was it? A burnt, uh, like a reddish brown is what bedellium is the color of, according to what we looked up anyways. The people went about and gathered it, ground it on millstones or beat it in the mortar, cooked it in, a, in pans and made cakes of it. And its taste was like the taste of pastry prepared with oil. When the dew fell on the camp in the night, the manna fell on it. Then Moshe heard the people weeping throughout their families, everyone at the door of his tent. And the anger of Yehovah was greatly aroused. Moshe also was displeased. So Moshe said to Yehovah, why have you afflicted your servant? Why have I not found favor in your sight that you have laid the burden of all these people on me? I can't even imagine the stress that he went through. Of, I mean, over 600,000 men alone, right? Did I conceive all these people? Did I beget them that you should say to me, carry them in your, in your bosom as a guardian carries a nursing child to the land which you swore to their fathers? Where am I to get meat to give to all these people? For they weep all over me, saying, give us meat that we may eat. I am not able to bear all these people alone because the burden is too heavy for me. If you treat me like this, please kill me here and now. If I have found favor in your sight and do not let me see my wretchedness. The most humble man ever. Of all the earth was Moshe. I, I bet his, his, this whole thing he said was probably in weeping and tears. He was so far beyond what he could handle. But Yehovah said to Moshe, gather to me 70 men of the elders of Israel, whom you know to be the elders of the people and officers over them. Bring them to the tabernacle of meeting that they may stand there with you. Then I will come down and talk with you there. I will take of the spirit that is upon you and I will put the same upon them. And then, and they shall bear the burden of the, of the people with you that you may not bear it yourself alone. Then you shall say to the people, consecrate yourselves for tomorrow and you shall eat meat. For you have wept in the hearing of Yehovah saying, who will give us meat to eat? For it was well with us in Egypt. Therefore, Yehovah will give you meat and you shall eat. You shall eat not one day, not two days, not five days, not 10 days, not 20 days, but for a whole month until it comes out of your nostrils and becomes loathsome to you because you have despised Yehovah who is among you and have wept before him saying, why did we ever come out of Mitzrayim? 
Are you hearing what I'm reading? Are you listening to this, Mishpaha? And Anthony actually in this message is going to be getting into a lot of the examples of Israel. So I'm going to try not to step on his toes. kind of. But man, do you want to know why your life is upside down or things are going sideways or whatever? Because of this right here. Not doing it his way. They complained and complained. Then they acted like what they had before was better than what he was doing. He was giving them holy food. I just to have one cake of manna. I, man. Seriously. I would never eat a donut again. <laughs> it would taste like styrofoam after eating that. It would be amazing. You know what I'm saying? Pastry. Italy ain't got nothing on y'all's manna. I'm sorry. And Italy's the best pastries in the world. But you know what I mean? This food. And that you would dare complain. And everybody's at the door of their tents. Whining like a bunch of crybabies. Oh, I had it so well in Egypt. It's like, no, you were dying. I t okay. All right. <laughs> All right, where am I at? Where? 16? 21? Do I hear 30? And Moshe said, the pe I'm, I'm in 21. Moshe said, the people who I am among are 600,000 men on foot. Yet you have said, I will give them meat that they may eat for a whole month. Shall flocks of herds be slaughtered for them to provide enough for them? Or shall all the fish of the sea be gathered together for them to provide enough for them? Yah should have said, and if I wanted to. And Moses would have said, okay, yes, sir. <laughs> And Yehovah said to Moshe, has Yehovah's arm been shortened? <laughs> Every time I read something like that, I'm like, I see, you know, I'm sorry. <laughs> it's just like, that's funny. It's a funny picture. Now you shall see whether what I say will happen to you or not. So Moshe went out and told the people the words of Yehovah. And he gathered the 70 men of the elders of the people and placed them around the tabernacle. Then Yehovah came down to the cloud and came down in the cloud and spoke to him and took the spirit that was upon him and placed the same upon the 70 elders. And it happened when the spirit rested upon them that they prophesied, although they never did so again. But two men here we have another, you know, the end from the beginning. Did you ever know there were two witnesses among the camp? Did you ever know that? There were two witnesses among Israel in the wilderness, even for a moment. And here it is. But two men had remained in the camp. The name of one was Eldad and the name of the other was Medad. And, the, and it's not Medad. <laughs> That's Medad over there. And the spirit. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, <laughs> and the spirit rested. Look. Look, and the spirit rested upon them. Now that uh, the spirit rested upon them. Now they were among those listed, but who had not gone out to the tabernacle yet. They prophesied in the camp. And young man ran and told Moshe said, Eldad and Midad are prophesying in the camp. So Yehoshua, the son of Nun, Moshe's assistant one of his choice men answered and said, Moshe, my Adon, forbid them. Then Moshe said to him, are you zealous for my sake? Oh, that all Yehovah's people were prophets. That Yehovah would put his spirit upon them. He's not because they're not listening. Moshe returned to the camp, both he and the elders of Israel. And that's the last thing I think I said about them. I'm don't know of any other place in scripture about them. So maybe the two witnesses is Eldad and Midad. Maybe they're the two witnesses. Eldad and Midad. Eldad, Eldad, how am I saying? Eldad and Midad. I want to know what those names mean. Eldad and Midad. God has loved and loved. Huh? God has love. Eldad is God has love. And, and Midad is his love, I think. 
Medad is what? I think it's love. Let me double check that. What kind of love? Yes. Wouldn't that be funny if they were the two witnesses in the tribulation? Right here, they were spoken of. Right here in the Torah. Like everything else you can find in the Torah, man. Why not? Why not? I don't know. That would be interesting. Okay. Um, verse 27 and... Uh, nope. Verse 31. Now a wind went out from Jehovah and it brought quail from the sea and left them fluttering near the camp. About a day's journey on this side, about a day's journey out on that side, all around the camp, and basically three feet deep above the surface of the ground. You're wading through quail. You imagine at your speed, how far could you get? So let's just say from here to Sterling. I could do that in a day. I know I could. I could walk that in a day. That'd be a rough walk, but I could walk that in a day. You're walking through three feet deep of quail on a day's journey. Hello? That's up to here, man. You know, some are around, depending if you're short or tall, might be up to your knee for Daniel. <laughs> but you know what I'm saying? Three feet deep of quail. He said it. He said it. You're going to have it till it's coming out your nostrils. He was mad. Yah was mad. And the people stayed up all that day, all night, all the next day and gathered the quail. He who gathered least gathered 10 homers. They spread them out for themselves all around the camp. But while the meat was still between their teeth, before it was chewed, the wrath of Yehovah was aroused against the people and Yehovah struck the people with a great plague. Very great plague. So he called the name of that place Kibrot Hata'ava, because they, because there they buried the people who had yielded to their cravings. That is dangerous. From Kibrot, uh, Kibrot Hata'ava, the people moved to Hezerot and camped at Hezerot. Then Miriam and Aaron. Right here, this is one of my favorite things I want to share. Miriam and Aharon spoke against Moshe because of the Ethiopian woman whom he had married, for he had married an Ethiopian woman. So they said, has Yehovah indeed spoken only to, through Moshe? Has he not spoken through us also? Yehovah heard it. Now the man of Moshe was very humble, more than all men who were on the face of the earth. Yeah. Suddenly, Yehovah said to Moshe, Aharon and Miriam, come out, you three, to the tabernacle of meeting. That's like dad going, come here. You're like, oh, I'm, you know you're in trouble, man, when, when they call you by name and get in here. You know, it's like, oh, man, what I do? Right. And so, of course, today's kids would be like, no, nah, I don't want to. Sorry. Um. Then Yehovah came down in the pillar cloud and stood in the door of the tabernacle and called out Haron and Miriam, and they both went forth. Now here, listen so carefully to this, because there is a real evidence of where Yah places us in his heart. Then he said, hear now my words. If there is a prophet among you, if Yehovah make myself known to him in a vision, I speak to him in a dream. Not so. With my servant Moshe. He's like this is how I talk to everybody but him. With him he says. He is faithful in all my house. I speak to him face to face. We have that opportunity now. Through Yeshua. Do you understand that? Yeshua spoke it says it in, what is it, Exodus 32 or 33? It says that he sat in the tabernacle face to face with Moshe as with a friend and spoke with him. This is what happens when you are faithful in all your house. This is how you get Yah to come and speak to you face to face. This is how you get him to come and show you why would Yah want to come and speak to you face to face when your heart is not completely his? So he gives you little things through other ways. 
or he speaks through other people or whatever it is. And it's not that being spoke to through something means that you're not listening somewhere else. But he made it clear. He said, even all those others that are mine, I speak to them through dreams and visions. But his whole house is faithful to me. His order, everything about him is faithful to me. Therefore, I speak to him face to face. Is that not what we should be seeking with all of our heart? Does he not say in Jeremiah 29, 13, if you seek me, you will find me when you search for me with all of your heart. Amen. Amen. Verse nine. So the anger of Jehovah was aroused against him and he departed. And when the cloud departed from above the tabernacle, suddenly Miriam became leprous as white as snow. So when you see somebody, and this is why I say we need to be careful of what we say. When you see a pastor fall or anything like that, you speak against them. Do you think you have that right to speak against them because they fell? You have no idea the anointing on that one. How many times in scripture y'all say, don't you dare speak against my anointed one? He told, um, what's his name? Come on, uh, Jacob and, and, and his wives and their dad. What's his name? Abraham? Laman? Laban. Laban, thank you, jeez. I kept thinking Haram and I was like, that's not right. Laban, Laban was getting mad and Yah came to him in a dream and said, you better be careful what you say to my son. Not good nor bad. I, I don't even allow you to say anything good to him. You just zip it, shut it up, and lock it up, and don't do nothing, right? Amen? I don't give you permission. We need to be a lot more careful of who you are willing to even think wrongly towards. You have no idea the anointing that may be on that man or woman by the Father and through the Son, Yeshua. Amen? Maybe be careful. That's why Yah says, if you get excited about your enemy being punished by me, I will pull my hand back. Because he might be doing this through you of that enemy, so that enemy could be saved too. And it may be you're speaking death over them. Oh man, it's just just turns around and punches you right in the gut, man. How careful. And, and it's convicting to me, I'll tell you that. More, it's, it's getting to the point, even for myself, I, I just want to stop talking altogether. Unless I'm really reading the word or preaching the word, I just don't want to say anything anymore. Because I'm so scared that everything that comes out of my mouth, I'm going to offend somebody somehow. Or if, if something bother, bothers me, maybe I might react wrong or they'll, they'll take me wrong. And I don't want to be that at all anymore. And maybe, you know, maybe we need to come to that point where we just shut up. Amen. Unless the Holy Spirit opens your mouth, you don't need to speak. Yeah. Unless it's to bring the word of God to somebody and edify them. Right. Encourage them. Right? Because, yeah. man, our mouth is a work in progress. Mine is always. And I, but I don't want it to be that it will always be a work in progress. I want it to be that there will be a day that y'all can actually look at me and go, you know what? Now I won't let any of your words fall to the ground because you have bridled your tongue. What a glorious day that would be for any one of us to be able to do that. Amen. But he shows it here through this. Moses is an example like Yeshua. And Miriam and Aaron are an example of be mindful of what you say about another, especially somebody in the spiritual leadership. Okay, so we're done there. Uh, oh, did I read the last couple of verses? Where am I at? Verse 11. 11. So Aharon said to Moshe, Oh, my Lord, please do not lay the sin on us in which we have done foolishly, in which we have sinned. Please do not let her be as one dead, whose flesh is half consumed when he comes out of his mother's womb. So Moshe cried out to Yehovah, saying, Please heal her, O Yehovah, I pray. Then Yehovah said to Moshe, If her father had put spit in her face, would she not be shamed seven days? 
let her be shut out from the camp seven days, and afterwards she may be received again. So Miriam was shut out of the camp seven days, and the people did not journey till Miriam was brought in again. And afterward, the people moved from Hetzerope camp in the wilderness of Paran. What? Huh? Is mic on? Can you hear? Okay. I think I just want to point out really quick, too, um, the mercy of Moses and the humility of Moses. Because I'm on one that I have. This one right here. You can't really run these two together. Oh. I said, I just want to point out here you know, the reason why I think Yah calls Moses the most humble man on the earth because he's showing his humility here with his willingness to intercede for Miriam, even though she just allowed her heart to be haughty. Miriam and Aaron, they allowed their hearts to become haughty and prideful and like the spirit of Korah pretty much. Yeah and challenge him and his position and his role that Yah had given him. I don't think Moses doubted his role for a second. He knew he knew who he was in Yah. Hey, oh yeah. I mean, he saw Yah face to face already by this point multiple times. Yeah, not... Yet, even in this moment where they're coming against him and saying, who do you think you are? Like, we hear from Yah too. He sees his sister become leprous. <laughs> His family become leprous and he pleads and cries out for her to Yehovah and says, please, please heal her. Basically, please forgive her. Amen. Please do not let this plague remain on her. That is pure mercy. Moses did nothing wrong, yet he's still here interceding, basically, basically pleading. And with he Yah was an intercessor to take this consequence off of his sister. And oh, man. that just shows, again, his humility in his heart. So, you know, that's uh, Anthony makes a really exactly. Anthony makes a good point. I want to, you know, the worst unforgiveness is among the brethren. Forgiving a stranger is easy. Anybody Somebody you don't even know, they did something you wrong, you, you forget it 10 seconds later after they're gone. You never see them again. There's no real offense. Real offense comes from those who you're closest to. That's where people get offended and hurt and all that stuff, right? But Moses shows the example that even though she did him wrong, if we, if we could look at each other the way Yeshua commands, even through Moshe, that we would see each other as pleading to Yah to not allow this to be upon that person. Instead of looking at them, we're so quick to get mad at each other and make each other our enemies. He could have been like, that serves you right? Yes. That could have been his heart. He, he just could have been like, dang, but she won't do that again, you know? It wasn't his heart at all. <laughs> it was the opposite. No, he begged. He begged, do we fight for each other like that? Do we, uh, go ahead, Chuck, here. Uh, I know you got a big mouth like mine, but you still need it. <laughs> well, what I was gonna say was anytime we see someone else being punished or that they fall, rather than ridiculing them or saying, oh, oh yeah, you got what was coming to you, we should always stop and think there, but by the grace of God, go act because any one of us could fall at any time. Yeah. That's right. Amen. If somebody, somebody's struggling and needs help instead of condemning them for not doing good enough or condemning them for, you know, why didn't you do a better job or why, you know, help them. Like, take your hand out and say, you know, I see they're having a hard time. I'm going to step in and help them. Because, right. That's, I mean, what does Messiah you know, do for us? Yes. We're, we're so quick to, to judge and be like, oh, look at them. Like, you're better? You're any better? Nobody's any better than anybody else. We all have struggles in certain areas. And if you're stronger in an area where you see somebody struggling, it's your duty to help that person. It is not your duty to condemn them. 
You're supposed to lift them up and vice versa. That's right. That's love. That's selflessness. <laughs> love and selflessness. That was, that was for Clint. <laughs> Michelle. Your neighbor is yourself. Amen. Are you done? Okay. You know, Michelle, that is exactly right on. Even bosses, they get frustrated. If you have somebody you're Praise God. Christ did the exact same thing at that cross. Forgive them for they not know what they do. is on us it's always on the men first the fathers it's on you just got to turn your hair and up no I'm just kidding <laughs> <laughs> you, you want to turn me up a hair I guess I'm a little whispery sorry dad <laughs> and, and, and not only that but the shepherds the leaders and Moses knew that you know we have to become more humbled Moses knew that. we really do we can never humble enough. We always have to be the first one. We have to show the mercy. And no matter how frustrated, The Father gets, He always brings a way of redemption. He always restores. He always heals. He always forgives. He always, He always does this. And especially He sees the struggle our children, His children go through. No, you you have to. <sighs> In every way, shape, and form, Yah just keeps showing us so much through His Word how we have to be the example. Mishpaha, fathers and mothers, husbands and wives, shepherds, especially if you're a shepherd and a father and a husband. That's triple whammy, dude. You're dead if you screw that up. <laughs> Just mess up one, you might as well just kiss it goodbye, dude. Two thirds ain't enough. We got to do it all the way, amen? amen? Let us not fail in any particular area. And let us always be ready to be merciful like that. Especially when there's struggles around them. There's not a one of us that doesn't have struggles around us. Sometimes we're handling it better than other times. Sometimes we're not. Sometimes it's harder and they need extra compassion. They need extra mercy. And you know, I, I've been praying. I asked you the other day, I want to know more about what it is to have that unconditional love that he has. I was even talking with Benjamin yesterday. Was it yesterday or day before we were sitting and having lunch? And I said, no matter what my fault is in anything, Yah's got to show us. You'll find out. Yah's got to show us. Are you hearing me? You have to let Yah show you. You have to let Yah show you. You have to be willing for Yah to humble you no matter where you're standing, no matter what you're doing. It doesn't matter if you're right or wrong. Every, you, you know, every confrontation that we have, 
if there's a confrontation, you have to have some part of wrong in that. Yeshua is the only one who was in confrontation that was always perfectly innocent. None of us ever are. It just, the mercy is beyond, is beyond words. It's beyond comprehension, but may it be put in us. Amen. Okay, did I finish it? Yep. Okay, so, all right, Zechariah, the, just last few verses, and then uh, he'll be up. All right, Zechariah 2, uh, starting at verse, I think it's just 2. Uh, 2.14. There is no 2.14. It goes to 2.13. Oh, they're doing it from the, the Tanakh version. Okay, it's all in there. So all of chapter two. No, no. It's not. It's like starting from like either ten or thirteen. I'm not sure. Zechariah two, starting in verse fourteen. I know there's no verse fourteen, but in the Hebrew Tanakh there is. So I think it's either verse one from chapter. So I'm just gonna read. It's either verse ten or verse thirteen. I'm not sure. Okay, well, I'll just start with 10. That way we know we, get, we catch it in there. Seeing it, okay, so Zechariah 2, starting verse 10 through chapter 4, verse 7. Sing and rejoice, O daughter of Zion, for behold, I am coming and I will dwell in your midst, says Yehovah. Many nations shall be joined to Yehovah in that day and they shall become my people. I will dwell in your midst. Then you will know that Yehovah Tzveo has sent me to you. And Yehovah will take possession of Yehuda as his inheritance in the Holy Land and will again choose Yerushalayim. Be silent, all flesh, before Yehovah, for he is aroused from his holy habitation. Then he showed me Yehoshua, Yehoshua, the high priest, standing before Hamalak Yehovah and Hasatan standing at his right hand to oppose him. And Yehovah said to Hasatan, Yehovah rebuke you, Hasatan. Yehovah, who has chosen Yerushalayim, rebuke you. Is this not a brand plucked from the fire? Now Yehoshua was clothed with filthy garments and was standing before the angel. Then he answered and spoke to those who stood before him, saying, Take away the filthy garments from him. And to him he said, See, I have removed your iniquity from you, and I will clothe you with rich robes. I said, Let them put a clean turban on his head. So they put a clean turban on his head, and they put the clothes on him. And the Hamalak Yehovah stood by. Then Hamalak Yehovah admonished. This is Yeshua, okay? If there's anybody who doesn't know who this is, Hamalak Yehovah, when it says the angel of the Lord, that is all Yeshua every time from the beginning of scripture to the end. So, uh, let's see. Verse six again. Then Hamalak Yehovah admonished Yehoshua saying, thus says Yehovah Tzveot, if you will walk in my ways, if you will keep my command, then you shall also judge my house. Likewise, have charge of my courts. I will give you, a, I'll give you places to walk among these who stand here. Here, O Yehoshua, the high priest, you and your companions who sit before you, <coughs> for they are a wondrous sign. For behold, I am bringing forth my servant, the branch. For behold, the stone that I have laid before Yehoshua upon the stone are seven eyes. Behold, I will engrave its inscription, says Yehovah Tzveo. I will remove the iniquity of that land in one day. In that day, says Yehovah Tzveo, everyone will invite his neighbor under his vine and under his 
fig. Now, the angel who, who talked with me came back and wakened me as a man who is wakened out of his sleep. And he said to me, what do you see? So I said, I am looking and there's a lampstand of solid gold with a bowl on top of it. And on the stand, seven lamps with seven pipes to the seven lamps. Two olive trees are by it. One at the right of the bowl, the other at the left. So I answered and spoke to the to the angel who talked with me, saying, What are these, my Adon? Then the angel who talked with me answered and said to me, Do you not know what these are? I said, No, my Adon. Hang on, I'm seeing. Okay, 21. So he answered and said to me, This is the word of Yehovah to Zerubbabel, Zerubbabel. Uh, not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says Yehovah Tzveo. You, I'm sorry, who are you, O great mountain? Before Zerubbabel, you shall become a plain, and he shall bring forth the capstone with shouts of grace, grace to it. Moreover, the word of Yehovah came to me, saying, The hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this temple. His hands shall also finish it. Then you will know that Yehovah's veil has sent me to you. For who is despised the day of small things? For these seven rejoice to see the plumb line in the hand of Zerubbabel. They are the eyes of Yehovah, which scan to and fro throughout the whole earth. Then I answered and said to him, what are the two olive trees at the right hand and at the left of the lampstand? And I further answered and said to him, what are these two olive branches that drip into the receptacles of the two gold pipes from which the golden oil drains? Then he answered me and said, do you not know what these are? I said, no, my Adon. He said, these are the two anointed ones who stand before the Adon of the whole earth. Now, many people believe that is direct reference to Revelation chapter 11, verse 4. All right. So, and then the last part of the Torah portion is Matthew 14, 14 through 21. And when Yeshua went out, he saw a great multitude and he was moved with compassion for them and healed their sick. When it was evening, his disciples came to him saying, this is a deserted place and the hour is already late. Send the multitudes away that they may go into the villages and buy themselves food. But Yeshua said to them, they do not need to go away. You give them something to eat. And they said to him, we have here only five loaves and two fish. He said, bring them here to me. Then he commanded the multitudes to sit down on the grass. And he took the five loaves and the two fish. Looking up to heaven, he blessed and broke and gave the loaves of the disciples. And the disciples gave to the multitudes. So they all ate and were filled. And they took up 12 baskets full of the fragments that remained. Now those who had eaten with their with, had eaten were about 5,000 men besides women and children. When you set up, when you set up before Yehovah, set up with all your heart. Do not enter into his presence on Shabbat any old way you feel like it. Do not come unto him in prayer any old way you feel like it. Come unto him in prayer with reverence and respect. Come to him on Shabbat clean and ready to be at his feet. Amen. 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 And now Brother Anthony's going to come up here.